Okay, guys, uh, welcome to the ECG fundamentals class. Uh, my name is Katarina White. I'm one of the education coordinators for the Texas division. And then I have my partner here with me. I'm Gilberto Manoli. I am an ICU nurse uh, with the Texas division as well as a nursing uh, education coordinator. So today I'm going to uh, kind of get you prepped and prepared for your uh, EKG exam. So you'll take your EKG exam before you actually start working with the patients uh, and just uh, just um, just uh, so you can have some awareness. This test is uh, done every year. So uh, annually, you'll take it every year in between the months of July through uh, September. So uh, if you're approaching and they ask you to take your, your annual EKG exam, don't go. You can get angry about it. So it's just an annual assessment. So the test, uh, usually uh, we just had a new update. And once those updates come out, uh, it's going to usually be the same uh, exam. We have a version A, uh, that's the first attempt. And then your version B is your second attempt. So it's usually the same question. So like if you have to retake a version A that you've taken like that first attempt, uh, your third attempt will be a version A again. So you'll get to take the version B one time if you uh, failed that first time. Um, so I'm going to uh, kind of go through some things uh, that you should be prepped and prepared for for this test. So I am going to um, uh, pull up one of my documents. Okay, so um, there is a 60 page study packet that goes with this exam. Um, from uh, what I could gather from looking at it, some of the, the test questions that's in that exam does not uh, apply to the new exam. Uh, we did meet with the company on Monday and they provided us with a new PDF. And uh, there are questions I think that's similar to what's on the new exam, but I didn't have enough time to review it and look at it and see uh, what you guys should focus on. So right now, just this little section here that says the, uh, the study packet, don't pay any attention to that because that has changed and I haven't had an opportunity to review that to be able to share with you the, the new updates. So um, just, um, just FYI, there are no PJCs or PACs on this test. So if you see that in the answer choice, do not choose that, okay? So you're gonna have a question with this, you're gonna have a strip, you're going to uh, be asked in the, there's, it's going to be in the answer choice, so don't choose that because you're not being tested on it. So that'll save you some time, okay? There are no sinus arrhythmias on this test. Now, you may see in the answer choice, sinus arrhythmia. Uh, please do not choose that as well, okay? So let's go with what you're going to be tested over. They're going to be testing you over PR interval, QRS duration, QT interval and rhythm interpretation. So um, at the time of this, uh, this was sent to me, it was 49 questions on the test. I took the test on Friday, version A, the same test that one of the other educators took and I noticed it was 47 questions. So I don't know if they, they got rid of some of the, the questions I'm not sure. Like I say, I took the test Friday and I don't have, a, I didn't have enough time to just properly look at everything and investigate it in time enough uh, with uh, you guys approaching this week. Uh, so I, I'll say between 47 to 49 questions, but 80% is still the passing score. Okay. Uh, version B, uh, there are 50 questions and 80% is passing. Okay. Right? And there are no calibers on the test. You can use the zoom in feature that is built into the uh, into the exam. Uh, it's no longer prophecy, it's relies, but built into the exam, you can uh, zoom in to look at your QT intervals, QRS and PR intervals. Uh, you can use your computer calculator on the, uh, or the calculator that's provided to you by your exam proctor. So that's just kind of giving you some, uh, some, 
some information before you prepare to take your test. Okay. So let me stop sharing my screen on that. And then I have uh, another thing I want to talk about and get you prepared. Okay. So as you prepare to take your exam, uh, this is the quick tip sheet. Uh, there is a lot of different criteria that you would need to know about and follow. Uh, so this tip sheet is going to kind of help guide you as you take your test. I've emailed uh, this to you because uh, I had to update it because there was some, there was some uh, one change that I noticed that wasn't on this tip sheet. So we're going to just kind of go through it. Uh, when you take your exam, uh, if you could, uh, two blank sheets of paper. One of your blank sheets of paper will be used for you to measure your QRS, PR interval, and so you can be able to decipher what that looks like. And then your other blank sheet of paper will be for you to write down these tips from memory as you take your test so you can be properly prepared. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's talk about first degree hard block. So uh, uh, first degree hard block is going to be a prolonged PR interval that's greater than 0, 0.20. So what that means, if you're taking the test and you measure your PR interval and you see that it's 0, 0.20 on the dot, that is not first degree hard block. I've had some people who say, well, it's 0, 0.20. And I look at your tip sheet, well, they misinterpreted uh, what I was trying to say. It's got to be greater than 0, 0.20. So if you see that it's 0.24, Two five or something like that. That's that's it's over point two zero. So that will classify as a first degree hard block based on that PR interval. Uh, the PRI is consistent, and there you're not going to see any dropped QRSs. Okay, uh, let's talk about the second degree hard block type one. Your PRI lengthens and is not consistent, but you will see dropped QRSs. Uh, second degree hard block type two, uh, PR interval is consistent and does not lengthen, and you'll see drop QRSs. Your third degree hard block is more like your medical emergency, and with that one, you will see no relationship between the P waves and QRS. There'll be some drop QRSs, and what I found with the questions that they provided us with, your heart rate for your third degree hard block was usually less than 50 beats per minute. So people were stuck between second degree type one and third degree hard block. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia, you have a heart rate between 100 to 150. And with that, you'll see an R to R interval that is regular. And moving to the supraventricular tachycardia, uh, just so you know, there is more than one name that this test has used and the answer choice is for supraventricular tachycardia. They also call it atrial tachycardia. They've also have called it atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. Okay, so you have all three of the different names that they have termed it. So if you're taking the test and you need to determine which what the answer would be, there's three different names for uh, SVT. Heart rate is between 150 to 350, and your order R interval is uh, regular. So if you're trying to figure out what is the difference between sinus tech and uh, SVT, it comes down to the heart rate. So if you have a heart rate that is 150 on the dot and there's a P wave, your best bet would be to go with sinus tech for you. If the heart rate is greater than 150, then you will start looking at supraventricular tachycardia. So that means if the heart rate was like 152, 153, I would kind of start looking at supraventricular tachycardia. Any questions about those rates and how that kind of decipher between that? Okay. So next you have a field with the rapid ventricular response. So I kind of put this font in a bigger font so that you'll know this uh, has an R to R interval that's irregular. And with a field with a ventricular rate of more than 100 to 180 beats per minute. So with regular AFib, if the heart rate is 100 or less, that's AFib. And the minute that you see that it goes above 100, that's AFib with a rapid ventricular response. Any questions about the AFib with RVR? Okay, all right. So let's talk about uh, the uh, uh, junctional rhythm and uh, the junctional rhythm category and the ideal ventricular rhythm category. So with your junctional rhythms, 
you'll have an order or interval that's regular. And then idioventricular rhythms, you have an order or interval that's, uh, that's, that's regular as well. So a lot of people get these categories mixed up. So I put some key points to remember so that you can kind of, um, you have an idea of how to decipher between the two. So with the key points to remember, uh, junctional rhythms, there are no P waves or those P waves can be inverted. On this new test, uh, I believe that all of the junctionals had inverted uh, P waves. Uh, the previous version, there was no P waves. So uh, just so you know that there are some inverted P waves with the uh, junctional rhythms. The QRS is going to usually be less than 0 0.12. And if you go down to this category, you'll see that idioventricular rhythms, there are no P waves, and the QRS is more than 0 0.12. So that's how you decipher by, by the Q, QRS. Okay. All right, so going back to the junctional rhythm category, uh, there was a new rhythm updated in this new version, junctional bradycardia. So that's something new and uh, you're probably not even familiar with. Well, you will see that it, it'll, it's going to have an inverted P wave, but the heart rate is less than 40. So if that heart rate is less than 40, then if you're thinking in this junctional category, you want to go with junctional bradycardia. Any, any questions on that junctional bradycardia? Okay. So now we have the junctional rhythm to look at. So if that heart rate is between 40 to 60 beats per minute, so if it's 40 on the dot, and we just talk about, uh, you know, 40 to 60, so if it's 40 on the dot, based on what they put in the criteria, junctional rhythm. But if it's less than 40 beats per minute, like if it's 39 beats per minute, then that's considered the junction of bradycardia. And that's how I interpreted it as I looked it up and researched it so that I can be able to uh, speak to it today for uh, you guys so you'll be able to understand it for the test. Accelerated junctional rhythm, uh, your heart rate is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So if you have a heart rate of 60 on the dot, that's going to probably be in the junctional rhythm family, junctional rhythm. So if it's 61, you want to go with accelerated junctional rhythm. Does that make sense? Any questions regarding that? Okay. Junctional tachycardia, your heart rate is between 100 to 150. So if it's 100 on the dot, that's going to be accelerated junctional. The minute it goes to 101, then that's junctional tachycardia. Any questions? Okay. Uh, let's talk about the idioventricular rhythm. So you have idioventricular rhythm, heart rate of 20 to 50 beats per minute. Um, if it's 50 on the dot, that's idioventricular rhythm. The minute it goes to like 51 beats per minute, then you can look at the accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Any questions regarding the uh, regarding that information? Tip sheet. No questions. Okay. All right, so we're going to start uh, going through the PowerPoint presentation. So uh, we didn't make any changes to the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we just decided to keep it the same so that we can just kind of just highlight what the new test entails. And uh, let's see, uh, what time should we be taking a break? So can you keep time? Can you keep tab when we need to take a break? Okay. Uh, so um, do you think about uh, 130, because we started about 1230 for a uh, break. Okay. So uh, if you can remind me, Gilberto or Miss Yvonne, to pause the, uh, the Zoom so that I can uh, 
the recording won't just run along you know, when we have our break. So if you could remind me to pause the Zoom. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk about the ECG fundamentals. And this was uh, created by the CHI Texas Division Education Department. So it was last revised in September of 2021. And so, like I stated earlier, we won't be making any change to the PowerPoint presentation. You have some practice that, that kind of prepare you for the new exam. And we'll go through that later. So at the end of um, this lecture, you should uh, you will be able to describe how an impulse is conducted through the electrical system of the heart, identify the waves produced on the ECG during a normal cardiac cycle, analyze and interpret the uh, rhythm strips, measure the, um, the rate, PR interval, and QRS complex. So I know this didn't mention anything about the QT interval, so but I will speak to that and play a video about the QT interval as we uh, progress along in class. So I didn't have enough time to make any adjustments to this. This is a, a big body of work to go back at the last minute on such short notice to, um, to properly get this together. So this is the overview of the heart, and it's going to watch a little video. Oh, the video isn't available anymore. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, why do I need an EKG? So these are the limb leads that we have here. And just, just a quick overview, an EKG takes a look at a person's electrical heart function from different angles. An echo takes a look at a person's mechanical heart function. So basic versus, basic versus, advanced EKG rhythm interpretation. So typical lead placement, uh, this is where you wanna make sure that all your leads are placed properly. You have uh, your black lead, your white lead, and you have the ground lead, green, and then your uh, red lead. So you probably heard, have heard some nursery rhymes to help you remember exactly where to uh, place your leads. I think I've heard of a smoke or a fire the cows graze green pastures so that you can kind of remember exactly where you need to place those leads and just remember proper lead placement is critical to proper uh interpretation of ekg rhythms and you know you assume that everyone knows how to place the leads properly but i've seen in the past uh, being a unit based educator that some people were quite aware of how to actually place those leads and we've had to do like some just some basic refresher training on that but it's nothing too critical, but just make sure you put it in the right place so that uh, the doctors can make sure they're making the right uh, decisions for the patient. So why do we typically look at leads two and V1? So uh, lead two follows the sinus pathways. And so you'll see here, uh, we have lead one, there's lead two, it follows the sinus pathways. Uh, V1 looks at the septum and helps detect bundle branch blocks. So you'll see uh, V1, V2, uh, if we want to see if that patient has a bundle branch block. So rule of electrical flow. So in the right arm, that's going to be a negative electrode. And if the electricity flows toward the negative electrode, the pattern produced on the graph will be inverted. So you see this is kind of inverted if it's a negative electrode. We won't be tested over that. This is just basic ECG fundamentals just to kind of get you uh, refreshed. And then if the electricity flows toward the positive electrode, the pattern produced on the graph paper will be upright. So you'll see here, this is upright. So your positive electrode uh, is going to be in your, you'll see that with the left leg. Okay. So this is the electrical conduction system of the heart. 
And so uh, it is important to understand the relationship between the electrical system of the heart and what we see on paper. So you can just see what this looks like. So the intrinsic impulse uh, rate conduction. So you have the supraventricular, which is the atrial. And so the SA node, you'll see a uh, heart rate between 60 to 100 beats per minute. AV node, uh, you'll see 40 to 60 beats per minute. With ventricular, uh, the right and left bundle branches, you'll see a rate of 40 to 50 beats per minute. PNG fibers, 20 to 40 uh, beats per minute. So the heart is supplied with an electrical conduction system that generates and conducts electrical impulses along specialized pathways to the atria and ventricles, causing them to contract. So let's kind of just go through the EKG vocabulary. So if you're not familiar with any EKG terms, you this was this will kind of kind of uh, refresh. So a wave is a positive or negative deflection from baseline that indicates a specific electrical event. You have P wave, Q wave, R wave, S wave, and T wave. Okay, and interval. Uh, that's the time between two specific ECG events, PR interval, QRS interval, and you'll also hear uh, a lot of us say QRS duration, and sometimes I'll say QRS complex. So, but that all means the same. QT interval and order or interval. Segment. That's the length between two specific points on an ECG that are supposed to be at the base line amplitude, not negative or positive. You have a PR segment and an ST segment. Complex, the combination of multiple uh, wave, wave groups grouped together. So you'll see uh, the only main complex on the ECG is the QRS complex. So depolarization and repolarization. Depolarization, the heart receives electrical impulses, and that's caused by positive sodium and calcium ions going, going into the cell. Repolarization is the resting phase of the cardiac cycle caused by positive potassium ions moving out of the cell. And depolarization equals contraction and repolarization equals relaxation. The sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node, the sinoatrial node is referred to as the pacemaker of the heart. The SA node is located in the wall of the right atrium at the junction with the superior, ven uh, with the superior vena cava. Specialized electrical cells called pacemaker cells in the SA node discharge impulses at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. So here we have uh, the P wave. The impulse that begins in the SA node or are demonstrated on the ECG as the P wave. And a P wave equals atrial depolarization and contraction. So you'll see here, there's our P wave. Now, if there's anything on your PowerPoint presentation that you need to pay special, special uh, attention to, I will uh, kind of emphasize that. So um, this is the P wave morphology. And so we want to pay some really close attention to the P wave morphology. Uh, as I was doing uh, remediation a lot with a, with a lot of staff, I noticed that a lot of people didn't really understand uh, inverted, notched, and peak. So we'll just kind of go into some little details about this. So this is a normal P wave. That's what a normal P wave looks like. This is notched. This is what a notched P wave looks like. This is peaked. That's what a peak P wave looks like. And this is what inverted looks like. So as you're taking your test and you're looking at those junctional rhythms, and remember I told you on the test, uh, there was a lot of uh, junctionals that had inverted P waves. So you just need to be mindful of what that looks like. So you can make your decisions and pick the right answer. The atrioventricular AV node, the AV node is located in the wall of the right atrium next to the tricuspid valve and has three functions. Slow con it slows conduction of electrical impulses through the AV node. It serves as a backup pacemaker if the SA node fails, and it protects the ventricles from dangerously fast rates. The intrinsic rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. 
So the PR interval, sorry. The PR interval, uh, the PR interval represents the time for the impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node. The AV node is the gatekeeper. And so you see here, this is the PR segment. And let me just kind of uh, put this in a different uh, full screen so that we can see. So um, the beginning of the P wave to the uh, beginning of the QRS complex, that is your PR interval. And the normal range is from 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. So if you can place emphasis on that, knowing that normal range, that's going to help you to decipher when you're taking your test to know if there's a block or something like that. 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds, I repeat, that's something that you would need to know so that you can make proper decisions when you're doing your ECG interpretation, knowing that normal range. QRS complex. So the QRS complex, uh, a QRS it is equal to the ventricular depolarization and contraction. The initial deflection of the QRS from the isoelectric line to the end of the QRS complex is measured from the beginning of the Q wave to the end of the S wave, the J point. Our, this is important to know. Normally, it has a duration of 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. Okay, your QRS duration. So that's something that you need to know. The duration is 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. Okay. Ventricular conduction. So with ventricular conduction, you'll uh, the, the areas that handles that will be your bundle of his, right and left bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers. The rate is 20 to 50 beats per minute. So putting it on paper. So that's kind of like, uh, do a deep dive into this. If you can take a picture of this, uh, make sure you uh, highlight it on your um, in your PowerPoint presentation. This is going to be the most important thing. Uh, what I found during remediation, no one really understood what a large square represented. So you have this large square, and large squares are defined by dark lines. Here's your dark lines. And are five small squares high. So if you see one, two, three, four, five, five small squares high. Page 22. Five small squares high by five small squares long. One, two, three, four, five. So that's going to be very important. So uh, as you're measuring your intervals, the PR intervals, QRS intervals, and QT intervals on your test, you'll need to know that. So I can tell you on the test, there's going to be a lot of there's 22 uh, measurement questions. So you'll need to know, uh, have some knowledge about this. Okay, so we have one small square equals 0 0.04 seconds. This is important to know. If you don't have any knowledge of this, you won't be able to to go through those intervals and be able to measure them and decipher what's going on in the test. I've had some people come to me and I was like, okay, you keep measuring. They were getting all the interpretations correctly, but they were getting the measurements incorrectly. I'm like, well, how are you measuring? And tell me what are you multiplying by? So they took one small box. It was two boxes. And so they took 0 0.06 times those two boxes. They thought that this one small box represented 0 0.06. I don't know where they got that number from, but that's why I want to just kind of make sure that you are aware of the small box versus your um, large square. Right. So basic EK, uh, the basic of EKG paper, so hash marks occur every three seconds or 15 large squares. So we have uh, five large squares equals one second. 15 large squares equals three seconds, and 30 large squares equals six seconds. So let's talk about our isoelectric line. The isoelectric line of, of uh, an electrocardiogram designates the flat part of the diagram in between the P waves and the T waves. This occurs when no electrical activity is occurring, 
impulses are too weak to be detected and is used as a baseline to identify the changing electrical movement. The beginning of the isoelectric line following the QRS complex is a visual cue of where the QRS measurement ends. So you have your positive deflection here. That's your J point, which equals the end of the QRS. Uh, this is your isoelectric line here, and that's a negative deflection. Nothing to kind of stand out on this, um, you know, on that slide. Here's our ST segment. Although the ST segment is isoelectric, the ventricles are actually contracting. So you will see here the ST segment. The amplitude should be less than 0 0.5 mm. Elevated or depressed is a hallmark sign of ischemia, uh, CAD or MI, STEMI. So this is what that looks like. You won't be tested over ST segment, but we, uh, we do have the Texas Heart Institute at Baylor St. Louis Medical Center. So you just need to be aware that you may have a patient that have elevated ST segment. And typically what you would do is follow the policy and protocol. You'll, you'll, uh, there's a cold STEMI, you can just call that through the page operator. ST segment issues, you hear uh, the ST elevation and then uh, ST depression right there. So just so you're aware of it, but you won't be tested over ST segment issues on this test. QT interval. So this is a new thing that you're going to be tested over QT interval. Um, measure from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T wave. So you'll see this is where you would properly measure and then uh, end it there. This represents the total of, uh, duration of electrical activity of the ventricles. So pay special attention to this. Normally, QT interval is from 0 0.34 seconds to 0 0.43 seconds. That is something that you would need to know as there are three, I want to say three QT interval questions on this new version. Okay. So this is your steps to properly interpret your rhythms. You want to make sure you identify your P, QRS, and T wave. Uh, determine regularity. Measure the rate. And you want to look to see if there is a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P. And measure the PR interval and measure the width of the QRS complex. So step one, you always want to make sure you identify the P, QRS, and T. So here we have our QRS. That's our QRS right there. And um, T wave, which is located there. And there's our P wave. Okay. Uh, here's another one uh, identifying the P, QRS, and T. So there's our QRS, there's our T wave, and there's our P wave. So you, looking at this P wave, that's a notch P wave. Right. But there, this strip used to be on the old version, and if no one got it right. So with the new version, doesn't even have this strip on. So there's another strip to identify your P, QRS, and T. There's your QRS. There's your T. And there's your P wave. Here's another one. QRS, T wave. And that's a P wave. So determining regularity. So to determine regularity, and you're going to be doing this on your test, so when you have a rhythm, you want to always make sure you're measuring it to see if the R to R interval is regular. You want to measure from the distance from the R wave to the R wave. So here is my QRS, right? So QRS. So that's the peak of my R wave. So I will be taking a piece of paper and hashing it out so that I can be able to determine if it's regular or not. The distance between the R to R should have little or no variation, less than three small boxes, okay? Here is irregular. You see what that doesn't, uh, if you tried to hash it out, this is a little bit different. 
So um, that's the difference between regular and irregular. So you want to mark the distance between the first and second R wave. So what I've seen in remediation, some people will take that piece of paper and they'll uh, they'll hash it out on that first uh, R wave and they'll go to the third or fourth one and hash it out there. You need to make sure that you, your hash mark is for that first R wave and that second R wave. And you're going to slide that paper to your second R wave and see if the second R wave and the third R wave may, uh, marches out. That's how you're going to be determined uh, regular or irregular. I've seen so many people miss a field with RVR because they didn't properly measure uh, and hash it out correctly. Right. So, um, like I was saying, the mark the distance between the first and second R wave steeples of, of the strip. Move your paper down the length of the entire strip to check for regularity and do not eyeball it. So I've seen some people, they'll do the first four R waves and say, okay, it's regular. And what was happening is they were missing the, the A fields or the A fields were RBR because it was irregular. They only just did a first, first four. Uh, so you want to make sure you go through the entire strip so that you can uh, make the proper interpretation. So measuring the heart rate. Uh, so you want to uh, measure the number of R waves and multiply times 10. You want to count the number of R waves in a six second strip, then multiply by the number uh, by the number 10. So here I have my uh, QRS complex. So this is my peak of my R waves. So I'm just going to count the peak of my R wave. One, two, three, four, five. And I take that and multiply that times 10, I get a whole rate of 50. That's how you count your whole rate using this method. And here, I'll come here and just count one, two, three, four, five. Multiply that times 10, and I get a whole rate of 50. Okay, and just kind of just to double back, there is some practice questions that I provided you with today that we're gonna go through. Uh, what I found that some of those questions you would need to use the 1500 method uh, and some you would need to use the R wave method. So uh, what I did was I put some practice so that we can discuss it and talk about it so that you can be properly prepared for the test on Friday. Is there a P for every QRS and a QRS for every P? So you'll see here um, there's a P wave. There's my QRS. P wave, QRS, you should have one P wave for every QRS. Whenever you start seeing you have a drop QRS, that should be a telltale sign that that may be a block because you should have one P wave for every QRS. Okay, so if we look at this, how many P waves uh, do you see and how many QRS? So if you can just just count, count and tell me how many P waves do you guys see? You see seven P waves? Okay. How many uh QRSs? Seven. Okay. That is correct. So that means that you have one P wave for every QRS. And that's what you want to see when you're interpreting your strips. You want to make sure you have one P wave for every QRS. Are we missing anything? No? Okay, good. We are not missing anything. Okay, so let's look at this one. Uh, how many P waves, how many QRSs do you see? Someone said seven P waves. Okay. And then how many QRS? Five. Okay. So we have seven P waves and five QRS. Are we missing anything? What are we missing? We have some drop QRS. So when you're interpreting your strip and you see that. That should be telling you something. Wow, this has to be some sort of block. When you start seeing drop QRSs, I want you to start thinking about 
one of the blocks. Now, first degree is the only block that does not have any drop QRS. I repeat, first degree block is the only block that does not have any drop QRS. So you want to measure your PR interval. So your PR interval um, configuration, what length is the PR interval? Remember, normal is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And this is equal to one box or five small boxes. It, does it remain the same throughout the strip? Is it fixed or variable? Examples of variable PR interval exist in second degree type 180 blocks. And you want to measure from the beginning of the P wave to the first deflection from the baseline at the QRS complex. And like I said, we have some practice today. Uh, this We can talk about this on paper, but it won't make sense until we start practicing and I give you some type of feedback on um, how to measure uh, appropriately. So measuring the PR interval, you want to measure from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. So right here, you'll see right before that positive deflection, you'll hash a mark right before that. And then right, right before your QRS complex starts to begin, that is where your PR interval. And you will start counting the number of small boxes in between these lines. And, and you'll multiply that times 0 0.04. That's how you would get your PR interval measurement. So determine the PR interval is normal. Look at a few complexes. So it is seven to eight boxes or 0 0.28 to 0 0.32 seconds. So this is prolonged, but it's fixed. So here, uh, your PR interval is about four to seven boxes or 0 0.16 to 0 0.28 seconds and it's variable. So the, our last step, I think it's our last step, no, next step, last. step six, measure the QRS complex. QRS complex, so you want to look and see uh, for your configuration, do all the QRS complexes look alike? PVCs are still QRS complexes, but they look a little bit different. And you do have some uh, PVCs on the test. And we did put some in the practice questions, the PVCs that are on the new test. I even got them wrong. They're, they're kind of difficult. So I tried to put that in our practice. So today we'll, we'll have something to kind of go by. The duration, uh, what is the QRS interval? Remember normal is 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. And this is uh, gonna be equal to one to three small boxes. You wanna measure from the beginning of the QRS complex all the way to the J point where the QRS turns into the ST signal. So um, the QRS complex practice one, so you wanna make sure you're measuring from the beginning of the QRS complex all the way to the J, J point where the ST uh, the QRS turns into the ST segment. So um, you would probably want to start right there and you'll end right there for your measurements. Now, it's kind of confusing. I did notice on the test that the, the, we, we had like maybe three or four people to take the exam uh, for the QRS complex. It was... Uh, a lot of the, the, the questions that I saw that were missed on the exam, I included that in the practice so that we can kind of take some time and look at it so we can kind of discuss it and talk about it because it was so difficult to kind of figure out what would be the right answer. So we'll have some practice with that today. Determine the QRS complex duration. And they, they counted two small boxes. So two times 0 0.04 is 0 0.08. So that's how they got that answer. And is that normal? Remember I told you to remember the normal range? So yes, that's normal, okay? Here is a, another QRS complex practice question. So determine the QRS complex duration. Uh, so they counted about 4.5 small boxes and that's 0 0.18 seconds. Is that normal? No, that's not normal. It's a wide uh, QRS uh, complex. 
Okay. So let's talk about our sinus uh, rhythms, which this is a page that you want to make sure you're aware of. Uh, I've had a lot of people come to me for remediation and they didn't know the normal heart rate for like sinus bradycardia and sinus, sinus rhythm. You know, it may, you can assume that someone knows until you assume that they don't know. So if you could just kind of highlight this page, pay particular attention to it so you'll know the normal uh, heart rates. Even though uh, your tip sheet, I just kind of put the most missed questions that I saw on the test people kept missing. So, but I didn't put the sinuses on there because that's something that, you know, it's pretty simple and easy. You just need to remember the number. So sinus rhythms indicates that the electrical conduction system is operating in an orderly fashion. And the SA node is uh, the origin of the rhythm. So what makes a rhythm an arrhythmia, uh, you have a rate below 60 or, or uh, over 100, or you're, you have a PR interval less than 0 0.12 or greater than 0 0.2 seconds. You have a QRS interval less than 0 0.04 or greater than 0 0.12 seconds, or you have a QT interval less than 0 0.34 or greater than 0 0.43 seconds, and then you have a variety of complex shapes. Okay. All right, so uh, let's see what our next slide is about. So before we actually go into this, uh, do y'all think we should take a, a break? Okay. okay, so I'm going to just pause this. Pause. Stop sharing. We're going to take a break now. They're going to take a break now. Uh, I'm going to pause. With... Okay, everyone, we're back from our 10 minute break. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen again so that we can um, continue with the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about normal sinus rhythm. So this is what normal sinus rhythm strip looks like. Uh, just to go over some key details about this, the rhythm is regular, which means if you hash out the order or interval, you're going to have a regular order or interval. Your rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. You're going to have the presence of a P wave. It's going to be present and upright. Uh, you'll see that the PR interval is usually between 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. And then your QRS measurement should be less than 0.12 seconds. Sinus bradycardia. The rhythm is regular. The rate is less than 60 beats per minute. You should have a P wave that's present and upright. Your PR interval is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And the QRS measurement is less than 0 0.12 seconds. Sinus tachycardia, you have a regular RR. Your heart rate is between 100 to 150 beats per minute. Your P waves are going to be present and upright. PR interval 0 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And QRS measurement is going to be less than 0 0.12 seconds. So let's talk about our atrial rhythms. So we have atrial dysrhythmias that are ref they reflect abnormal electrical impulse formation and conduction in the atria. The atrial kick allows the ventricles to fill with about 20% more blood than would normally enter it if the atria did not contract efficiently. This gives 20 to 25% of cardiac output. Most atrial dysrhythmias are not life-threatening. Some are associated with extremely fast ventricular rates. An excessively rapid heart rate may compromise cardiac output. So let's talk about atrial fibrillation. So as you can see, your rhythm is going to be irregular. Remember I told you your order or interval is going to be irregular. And I've had a lot of people who didn't measure. They measured uh, the first uh, R wave and the second R wave, but they didn't hash it out throughout that strip. And they were not able to discern, discern that that was an irregular R to R interval, and they missed that AFib question. Um, with your atrial rate, it's going to be unable to be measured. As you can see, the fibrillatory pattern here, you can't measure that atrial rate, but you can measure the ventricular rate, and it should be less than 100 beats per minute. 
So if I was to count this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, multiply that times 10, and that's 100. So this would be just regular A field. So your P waves are going to be non-discernible. You're not going to have a PR interval, and your QRS is going to be less than 0.12 seconds. If rate is above 100 beats per minute, it's atrial fibrillation with RBR. Okay. So let's talk about AFib with RVR, AFib with a rapid ventricular response. So you have a R to R interval that's gonna be irregular. So you'll see that if you were to take uh, your paper and hash out R wave number one and two, and then just kind of march it out, you'll see that there's some irregularities. You're not gonna be able to measure the atrial rate, but you will be able to measure your ventricular rate. So we can count this as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 18 times 10, 180 beats per minute. You're not gonna be able to discern your, uh, uh, the P waves because of the fibrillatory pattern. PR interval, not gonna be able to discern that as well but your QRS should be less than 0.12 seconds. If the rate is above 100 beats per minute, is it atrial fibrilla fibrillation with RVR? So if it's greater than 100, that's going to be AFib with RVR. Okay. Don't call this an SVT. Okay. And then, uh, so my colleague here was just mentioning not to call this an SVT. So what we have seen on the, on the test in the past, a lot of people confuse SVT and AFib with RVR. They confuse those two rhythms. So to decipher between your AFib with RVR and your SVT, it comes down to measuring your R to R interval. Is the R to R interval irregular or regular? If it's irregular, that's AFib with RVR. Okay, any questions about that? Atrial flutter. You'll see a uh, regular or irregular, it just depends. And then you have uh, sometimes your atrial rate could be between 250 to 350 beats per minute and the ventricular, uh, it varies. You have a fluttered sawtooth appearance, as you can see here. Uh, you're not gonna be able to discern what the PR interval is gonna look like, but your QRS should be less than 0.12 seconds. Atrial flutter is characterized by a sawtooth flutter waves. Any questions about the atrial flutter? Superventricular tachycardia, also known as atrial ventricular nodal reissue tachycardia. So we had to add that last time. So many people were missing questions on the test because they were like, well, I've, I've never heard of this. I've actually had to look that up. I'm like, okay. But so just so you know that they, they can be used interchangeably. The rhythm for this will be regular. Your heart rate, however, is going to be between 150 to 300 beats per minute. And if you count this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19 times 10, that's 190 beats for your heart rate. So this will classify as our superventricular tachycardia. Now, the presence of the P wave may be hidden in the QRS or T wave. So you may see some SVTs that might not necessarily have a P wave. That, does, that doesn't mean that it's junctional tachycardia, because if that heart rate is greater than 150, it can't not be junctional tachycardia. But your, some of your P waves may be hidden. Okay. Usually, you cannot measure the PR interval, and your QRS is less than 0 0.12 seconds. And it's a fast, it's, uh, it's fast, greater than 150 beats per minute. It's regular. It's so fast, you can't see the P waves. Okay. The rhythm originates above the ventricles, making the QRS complex less than 0 0.12 seconds. So let's talk about our junctional rhythms. You see we have a picture of the heart with the negative and positive electrodes or the AV impulse. This is lead two. So here you'll see that is normal P wave from the SA node. And you see this P wave is inverted, inverted P wave from the SA node, AV node, sorry, AV. 
And then here there's no P wave and then you have a retrograde P wave from the AV node. Now remember on this test, I took it last Friday and what I can determine that all of the P waves on the test for the junctional rhythm family, I noticed that there were inverted P waves. Okay, now keep in mind, sometimes you may not have a presence of a P wave. In the past, the previous version, the junctional rhythms didn't have a P wave, but on this test, the new version, the P waves are inverted. Okay. So here we have junctional rhythm. So uh, as you can see, there are no P waves. And just looking at this, can someone count that whole rate and tell me what you count for the whole rate? 50, okay. All right, so 50 beats per minute. So the order R is regular. It's between 40 to 60 beats per minute. And you count it 50. So we have an inverted or absent P wave. So our P wave is absent. PR interval is less than 0.12 if present. And then we have a QRS less than uh, 0.12 seconds. So this is a regular rhythm, no P waves, inverted P waves, or retrograde P waves. But in this case, there were no P waves in the lead two. This is the lead. They originate above the ventricles, which means the QRS complex is narrow, 0.12 seconds or less. So that's how you would determine your junctional. Okay. So we have accelerated junctional. Um, if someone would count that heart rate and tell me what you get. Eighty. 80? Okay. So we have eighty for the heart rate. Now the order R is regular, and this rate falls between this category, so we're good. So that's accelerated junctional. Now the P waves here are absent. Our QRS is uh, less than 0 0.12. And then, uh, sorry, PR interval. PR interval is less than 0.12, and then our QRS is less than 0.12 seconds. Here's our junctional tachycardia. So this one was on the previous version. Everyone would get this one mixed up with uh, either sinus tach, uh, sinus tach. So as you can see, that's no P wave. This is QRS, and that's a T wave. If someone can kindly count the heart rate and tell us what that uh, heart rate is. One forty. Okay, one forty. So the uh, order R is regular. Our heart rate is one forty, so it's within that range, and our P wave is absent. So this is no P wave. Q R S T. No P wave, QRS, T. So a lot of people thought that was sinus tech on the test and they got it wrong and it was actually junctional tech. PR interval, if it's present, it's gonna be less than 0.12 seconds. And then QRS, less than 0.12 seconds. So just to kind of summarize the junctional rhythm. So this is, this is prior to me knowing about junctional bradycardia. So that's not on there. I didn't have enough time to actually go through that and add it, um, being so late and, and needing to record this so that we can have some content for the next uh, group. But we do have practice questions with junctional bradycardia to kind of get you uh, comfortable with it. So the junctional rhythms, 40 to 60 beats per minute, accelerated junctional, 60 to 100 beats per minute, and junctional tech, 100 to 150 beats per minute. So we have the ventricular rhythms, the impulse starts somewhere in the ventricles and all QRS complexes will be wide. You will have something that's, uh, it'll be greater than 0.12 seconds or greater than three small boxes. So let's talk about that idioventricular rhythm. So just so you know, idioventricular rhythm is lethal. So if the monitor tech tells you your patient is in idioventricular rhythm, you wanna go ahead and start calling, uh, calling the cardiologist to make them aware, okay? So your order R interval is gonna be regular. So if you measured the QRS, which is the, R, the, the peak of the R wave, this is your QRS here. But if you measure the peak of this R wave and hash it out, it's gonna be regular. Can someone count the rate and tell, tell me what that rate is for this rhythm? 50, okay, so that's 50 on the dot. So this is gonna be idioventricular rhythm. And there are no P waves. PR interval, so you don't have a P wave, so you can't really, like you don't have a PR interval. And the QRS is greater than 0.12 seconds. Look how wide 
and bizarre your QRS is greater than 0 0.12 seconds. That is what deciphers the junctional rhythm family from the ventricular family, the QRS. You'll have a wide and bizarre QRS. So it's regular, no P waves are present, originates in the ventricles, which means the QRS complex is wide and greater than 0 0.12 seconds. Uh, here's accelerated ideoventricular. This is also a lethal rhythm. So if someone's telling you the monitor tech is saying there's an accelerated ideoventricular rhythm, you want to go ahead and start reaching out to your cardiologist to make them aware. The order R is regular. And if someone could count that heart rate and tell us what they think that heart rate is. 80, okay, so we're in between the range. So yes, this classifies as an accelerated ideoventricular based on the heart rate. Now there's no P waves, so we don't have a PR interval to, to be able to look at, but the QRS is gonna be greater than 0.12 seconds. So let's talk about ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is one of those rhythms when you see it, you should be able to recognize it when you see ventricular tachycardia. Uh, there's that this is one of those rhythms I tell you to study and get comfortable with because you don't have time to pull out a strip and say, okay, let's figure out what's happening. Uh, what to, what should I do? Because you don't know if it's pulseless VTAC or VTAC with a pulse because based on whether the patient has a pulse or if the patient doesn't have a pulse, I mean, you would have to be doing some defibrillation if the patient was pulseless. So you don't want to be wasting time. I think the American Heart Association gives you less than maybe you have a, within the first three minutes or the first two minutes, you need to be shocking. So you, this is pretty quick, right? So let's look at this. It's usually regular. So if I took the peak of this QRS, right? And I try to take a piece of paper and hash it out. This is gonna be regular. And then your heart rate is gonna usually be greater than 100 beats per minute. You're not gonna see the presence of a P wave or a P or interval, but your QRS is gonna be wide and bizarre, greater than 0 0.12 seconds. What I've seen, a lot of people get VTAC and VFib mixed up. The difference between VTAC and VFib comes down to one thing, regularity. VTAC, R to R is regular. V field, your R to R is irregular. So on the test, some people were picking V field for the answer when it's actually V tap. Okay. And just remember, this is a lethal rhythm. So I don't go and say, well, uh, they're in V tag. I'll deal with this when I come back from my lunch break. Okay, so we want to make sure we get on top of that right away. All right, let's talk about the types of VTAC. There is two different types of VTAC we need to kind of just make you aware of. We have monomorphic and we have a polymorphic VTAC. Okay, so if you look at the pattern of the QRS, look at this pattern, then look at that pattern. Does this pattern look the same or different? Okay, and what about this one? Different, okay. So monomorphic, the pattern of the QRS looks the same. Polymorphic, the pattern of the QRS looks different. So that's the difference. That's how you decipher between monomorphic and polymorphic. So monomorphic, you will see a monomorphic V tag on the test. Okay. So let's talk about V field. It's a lethal rhythm. The R to R interval is chaotic. You cannot measure it. But like I said, people mix those up on the test with the V tag, V field. So just know that the R to R uh, regularity is chaotic. You're unable to measure a rate. There's not a presence of a P wave, so you don't have a PR interval. 
and you don't really have a QRS um, uh, measure. This is one of those rhythms that the only way to treat this is with, what do you treat this with? Defibrillation. Yeah. So let's talk about the types of V-fib. So we have two different types. We have a, a coarse and a fine. So remember, uh, I talk, talk, told you that we have a, we have one of those V-fields that people will mix up with VTAC. This is the, the strip that they would mix up with one of the VTACs. But if you were to take the height of the, uh, the R wave and try to measure out, this would be an irregular, uh, it would be irregular. So this would be classified as V-field. So let's talk about the difference between coarse V-field and fine uh, V-field. So you remember we had that one small square that was five boxes high, five boxes across, all right? So when you're looking at this, if you see that uh, your measurements are greater than three, uh, the waveforms are greater than three mm's or greater, so you can use that the height of that box. If it's greater than three, that's coarse. If it's less than, the waveforms are less than three, that's fine. So that's how you can decipher between coarse and fine. Any, any questions about that? So premature complexes. So with the premature complexes, uh, the beats comes in before the next anticipated cardiac cycle, where early beats originate determines what it looks like. So with your PACs, they originate in the atria, the hardest to identify, and it looks like an early sinus beat. It's upright P wave, but a narrow QRS. PJCs originate at the AV junction. There are no P waves. They can be in. Uh, can have inverted or retrograde P wave in a narrow QRS. And PVCs originate in the ventricles. They have the, it's the elephant in the room. There's no P wave but a wide QRS. Um, and you want to always list the underlying rhythm first and then name the premature complex. So here's an example. Silence rhythm, rhythm with PAC. Okay. So let's go over a uh, premature atrial contraction. Now I took the test on Friday, as I mentioned earlier. And there were not any PACs on this version. Now, you still need to have some awareness of what a premature atrial contraction looks like, okay? So you're going to have an irregular R to R interval. So if you measured this R to R interval, you would notice that it's irregular. Your rate is going to be deferred to the underlying rhythm. So who can count that rate and tell me what you get for your heart rate? Seventy. Okay. So, is that sinus rhythm or sinus break? That's sinus rhythm. So we got our underlying rhythm. Uh, we have so we know it's sinus rhythm. But if you look at your P wave, so this first P wave is a normal P wave. Now look at those other P waves. Do they look different? Does any one of those look different? Do you see a peak P wave in there? So this is your normal P wave. Compare the P waves to that first P wave, which is normal. Okay. That's correct. So what I'm trying to say is the P wave morphology kind of changes. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of, so you could, this test updates a lot, so I just want to make sure that you have some a good understanding of um, premature atrial contractions. So give me just a second. I'm going to just stop sharing that, and I'm going to uh, look up a, a, a video that I would like you to kind of have some awareness about premature uh, atrial contractions.
Okay, so what's the criteria we use to interpret a PAC on our ECG tracing? Well, the P stands for premature, which means the complex is going to come prior to the next expected B. So as you're marching out of your R waves, this will come before the next expected complex. It's premature. It's a PAC atrial but not sinus. So this impulse is originating somewhere in the atrial chamber, but not from the sinus node. It's taking a different pathway because it's coming from a different area, thus creating a different shaped P wave. The morphology will be different. It'll always be upright, but it may be a little flattened and it's not gonna look like a regular sinus P wave. Now, because the PAC has really no impact on ventricular conduction, the QRS should be narrow less than 0.12, and honestly, it should look like all the other QRSs within that strip. So the big takeaway comes premature, the P wave looks different. It has a P wave, but it looks different. QRS remains the same. And that's the criteria to determine a PAC on your ECG tracing. I'm Mark, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Okay. Now look at those P waves again. That first one was a normal P wave. He mentioned that this one looks a little bit different. And actually that one looks different. So those are your PACs. If you go back to that one, that looks like the same one that looks normal. And you go here, your P waves look different. So these are where your PACs are located. Okay. Does it make sense now that you watch the video to kind of see that the morphology changes so that you can see? what a PAC looks like. Okay. So you, the presence of a P wave is present or hidden in the T waves. Uh, you have PR interval uh, 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds. That's going to be the range. QRS is less than 0 0.12 seconds. You have early contraction, narrow, com a narrow complex QRS, upright rounded P waves that lead to but just remember your morphology is going to be different from a normal P wave. Okay. Here's a premature ventricular contraction. So your order are mm, going to be irregular because you have that PVC that, that kind of just throws off the pattern of your order R interval. Your rate, you're going to look at the underlying rate. So if someone could count that heart rate for me. You can actually count this PVC in that heart rate. You got about 110? Okay. All right. So this is actually one of the questions from that the old version of the test, and it was like sinus tech with a rare PVC. So you're not going to have the, pre, uh, so you'll have a, the presence of a, P, the P wave will be like, it, you won't have any because you have a topic B. So here is our PVC where you don't have a P wave, but you can see these normal rhythms here, you have the P waves, but when you get this abnormal beat, there's not going to be a P wave, so you don't have an interval. Your QRS is going to be greater than 0.12, so this is wide and bizarre. So you will see an early contraction, wide QRS, but no P wave, so this is, this is referencing that. Okay, so let's talk about the PVC grouping. Uh, a lot of people uh, had trouble with the bigeminis and trigeminis on the test. Uh, there are some strips that I put in our practice so that we can have something to go by. So here we have a strip. And if you count your heart rate, you can count it with your uh, PVC. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10. This is heart rate of 100, so that is going to be sinus rhythm. But you see your first beat is a normal beat, which means it has a P, QRS, and a T wave. Right here, there's no P wave, but there is a wide and bizarre QRS with an elevated T wave here. Okay, So we can say beat 1 is normal, beat 2 is abnormal. Beat 1 is normal, beat 2 is abnormal, beat 1 is normal, beat 2 is abnormal. 
every time you have a PVC that falls on the second beat, that is by Jimmy. Any questions about that? Okay. Here we have uh, our next beat. I'm going to count our horn rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have a horn rate of 100. So we have PQRST, PQRST, and then we have a PVC. So beat one is normal, beat two is normal, but beat three is abnormal. We have a PVC. Beat one is normal, beat two is normal, beat three is abnormal. We have a PVC. So every uh, third beat that you have a PVC that occurs, that is trigeminal. Does that make sense? That's the easiest and simplest way for me to kind of communicate this to you so you'll be able to understand the difference between those two. When interpreting the rhythm strip, describe the basic underlying uh, first, then add additional information. So uh, as you can see here, we have normal sinus rhythm. So that's our underlying rhythm. And then we have our PVC. So include the PVC as a beat when calculating the heart rate for irregular rhythms. Other important rhythms. Let's talk about asystole. Asystole pretty much should be pretty simple to decipher. I didn't include that in the practice test because I, I kind of figured you guys know how to figure that out. Okay. So there's no activity, the rate is absent, the presence of a P wave is absent, the PR interval is absent, and the QRS measurement is absent. So it's the absence of electrical activity. The patient has no heartbeat, and you, you have these patients, you have to uh, do a cold blue with those patients. But this is a lethal rhythm. Okay. So let's talk about our pace rhythms. So here we have atrial uh, ventricular pacing, which is dual chamber pacing. And so you have spikes. You have a spike right before a P wave. And you have a spike right before your ventricle, which is your QRS. So think about P is atrial, and think about QRS as your ventricles. So this is atrial ventricular pacing. Now on this test, uh, they kind of switched it up a little bit. They, we put some of the new pacing rhythms on our practice test so that we can kind of go through those and get you comfortable with it. Okay. And I won't go into any more details about it right here because we're going to pull up the practice test and we're going to go through it, go through that together. And then this is a ventricular pacing. So you have one pacer spike right before QRS complex. So there's no P wave. So this is QRS, that's T, QRS, T, but you have a spike right before the QRS. Remember, you can think about the QRS as your ventricle. So this is ventricular pacing. So atrial ventricular blocks, and uh, also known as heart blocks. So this is uh, where people get a little bit nervous measuring blocks. Uh, and get a little bit uncomfortable when they're taking their test uh, with blocks. Uh, as I was taking this test on Friday, the thing that kind of kind of threw me off base is they didn't have any third degree roll blocks on this test, and I thought that was odd. But we're still going to go through it so that you can be able to decipher between it. And I didn't see any second degree type ones on the test. They just did a first degree and. You know, Second degree type two, so I thought it was odd, but you you you're still responsible for knowing how to interpret and understand what a third degree horror block is. Okay, so the the term horror block is used to describe arrhythmias in which there is a delayed or failed conduction of electrical impulses through the AV node into the ventricles. The PR segment represents the AV node and the ECG, and it is important to the important in determining the type of AV block. So here's our first degree heart block. So if someone would like to count that heart rate for me, tell me what you get. 80? Okay. So is that sinus rhythm or sinus break? Sinus, sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm. So if we know that our underlying rhythm is sinus rhythm. So our order or interval is going to be regular. And we're in that rate of 60 to 100 because we know this is sinus rhythm. Uh, your P wave is going to be present and upright. You're going to have one P wave for every QRS. We're not missing any QRSs. Your PR interval is going to be greater than 0 0.2 seconds, and it's going to be fixed. So if you look 
very closely, you'll see that, okay, you would start right here measuring and you would end it right there. So if you count the number of boxes that you see, let me see if I can uh, get this to uh, much more screen so that we can look at this a little bit more in detail. So let's, let's say, for instance, we put a hash mark right there, right there on that line, and we end it right there. So if we count, that's five boxes, six, seven, eight. Eight times 0 0.04 is what? That's about point, 0 0.32, okay. So that's greater than 0 0.20. So that classifies as a first degree Hoare block because this is these are gonna be fixed. That means that each and every last one of these PR intervals is gonna be 0 0.32. And then your QRS measurement is going to be less than 0 0.12 second. So it's going to be a regular rhythm, no drop QRS complex. PR interval is the same length and it's fixed. And you're going to name the underlying rhythm first, usually either sinus rhythm or sinus bradycardia. Okay. Sorry about that. So let's talk about the next block, which is Mobitz type one, also known as second degree Hall block type one. The order or interval is going to be irregular. You're usually going to have beats between, uh, your heart rate is going to be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. And if you count the heart rate, that's 50. Uh, present and upright, I wouldn't necessarily go with an actual rate with this, but if you look at your P's, QRST, P, QRST, P, QRST, you have a P wave, but you have a drop B. P wave, QRST, P wave, QRST. So you're going to have the presence of a P wave. It's going to be upright. It's going to get progressively longer until a QRS drop is variable. So we have a drop beat. And if you measure these PR intervals, you would see that it was getting progressively longer. So that constitutes inconsistency with our first degree, uh, not first degree, but second degree or block type one. PR interval is inconsistent. And drop QRS. You may uh, see that your QRS is less than 0 0.12 seconds. So you'll see irregular rhythms, dropped QRSs, and PR interval changes as variable. Not all your P waves are conducted. All right, so let's talk about second degree horn block type two. It's going to be irregular. You see the horn rate is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Horn rate is 70. Uh, this says less than 60 beats per minute. I wouldn't necessarily go into the detail with the horn rate with, with this because their third degree is the one you're going to be looking at if it's less than 50 beats per minute. But let's look at our P waves, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. There is a P wave. There's a drop Q, R, S right here. P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. So we had a drop beat. So this had fixed, if you measured it out from the PR interval, you would hash it out for where the P wave begins to where the QRS uh, begins to get your PR interval. You would take your paper and just hash it out to each one with the exception of the one that has a drop beat and measure to see if it's staying fixed. And that's how you'll know that it's a uh, fixed uh, PR interval, and that deciphers second degree four block type two, which is pretty simple and easy to get, especially if you have a drop beat. But we'll practice to get you comfortable with this. Here's a third degree hall block. Third degree hall block is a lethal rhythm. With that, if you're working and you have a third degree hall block, especially if it's on a weekend, you want to make sure that you have a 
crash cart handy, call rapid response, call a cold team. That patient would need to have transcutaneous space. So the order R is regular and the PDP is irregular. So if you can see here, QRS, T, there's a P, QRS, T, P. So this P wave is hidden in that. P, Q, R, S, T. There's a P wave. There's a drop B. P, Q, R, S. So we have a T and then we have a P right there. This small little pump right there. That's a P wave. And we have another QRS, P, Q, R, S. So there's a drop QRS here. And drop QRS there. But there's no relationship between the P waves and QRS, and the QRS measurements vary. So our heart rate is one, two, three, four, five. This is a regular rhythm, more, than, more P waves than QRS, and the PR interval changes. Now, this is one of the strips from the old version. And on the old version, there were three third degree heart blocks for version A. Uh, two of them had heart rates of less than 50, and I think there was one, which is this one, that had a heart rate of 50 on the dot. But like I said, there's not any, since when I took the, when I took the test, there were, there were not any third degree heart blocks. So this is just a recap. This is a good page to go back to and refer to when you're trying to figure out your blocks. And just remember, first degree heart block, you have a fixed PR interval. That means you're going to have the same number of boxes, and there are not going to be any dropped QRSs. So as you can see here, eight boxes. You don't have any dropped QRSs. Second degree type one, you're going to have PR interval inconsistency. So that means that each box is going to be different, and you're going to see some dropped QRSs. So if you can see, you have dropped beats, and then you have inconsistency in your PR intervals. Second degree type two, it's going to be a fixed PR interval. As you can see, six boxes all the way across, but you're going to have some dropped QRS. With a third degree heart block, look at your heart rate, one, two, three, 30, but you're, you have no relationship between your P and QRS. There's no relationship. And that's what makes third degree hard block very uh, dangerous. All right. So uh, let's see, we have 223. I don't know if we need to take a break before we start practicing, because this is the rest of this is pretty much practice all the way through. Stop sharing. We're going to take a quick five. OK, so we're back from our break. And so what I've decided to do, uh, is to use the new practice material that we have developed from the new version that was uh, that was updated on January the 2nd of 2024. So we're going to uh, get that information and post it so we can start uh, going through those questions now. So give me just a second. All right, so we have our uh, first strip on that practice ECG test that I've given you. So we're going to go through this. This is 22 questions that I pulled from the new version. And the first question is, going, is asking, what is the PR interval? So just remember, you're measuring from the beginning of where the PR interval begins to the 
you're going to be measuring from here to about there. So if you could just go through it and just tell us what you're thinking. For that first question, and if you can, after you've, uh, you can tell us what you got for your answer so we can kind of go through it and, and look at it, talk about it. If you, I have a, a calculator and a magnifying glass if you need to use it. If you're done with that first question, raise your hand so we can talk about it. One, two, three. Just okay. So it's waiting up. Okay. And Jared, have you uh, determined what you think it is for number one? No. I can't even see the boxes. You can't really see the boxes? Yeah. Okay. Okay, just yeah. Okay. All right. So uh so someone tell me what they got, what they think. Hmm. You got 0 0.12? 0. 0. 0.20? Okay. Anybody else? You got 0. 0.20? Okay. Same. Okay. What do you think, Jerry? Just guessing. Because I, I, mean, I, I, I did the same like, thing. Yeah, I mean, one looked like it was, it looked like it was a little bit different on each one, actually. Okay, so on that first one, what do you think? Uh, it's coming up with 0. 0.20. 0. 0. 0.20? Okay. You have the, the answer key? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what is that first answer? A. A, 0. 0.12. If you look at the, the QRS complex, well, I mean, what we're measuring PR. We're measuring right? PR interval. PR interval. So from here, the beginning to here, um, it should be about three boxes. Do you see three boxes? You can't see anything. Okay. So if we. And I hate this little point. This thing is not pointing like I would like. Let's start this up. So we put a little hash mark right there on that line. And we put one right there. And then we count in between how many boxes do we have. This is, a, we're going to put a line right there. And we're going to end it right there. So we have an imaginary line there. An imaginary line there. How many are we counting? One, two, three. So that's about four. So, but they don't have 0. 0.16 on here as an answer choice, correct? No. So let's pick this one. We'll hash about there and there. One, two, three. So we hashed about right there, put a line about right there. And we'll be counting one, two, three. So that's about 0. 0.12. You really can't see it, but just to kind of give you an idea, so as you take this test, you'll be prepared. Because if you got it wrong here today, you'll get it wrong on the test. And we both worked together on this, and I had to pull out my magnifying glass. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next question, number two. It's asking you, what is the PR interval? You just tell tell us what you think once you're done.
Okay. You said zero point two four. Okay. All right. And then any other uh, answers, or because we all may have different thoughts about what it should be. Any other answers different from the zero point two four? Mm -hmm. Zero point three zero. Okay, so we have another answer choice. Okay, zero point three zero or zero point two four. Okay, is that it? Everyone's done. So, are y'all ready for that answer? Point two four. If you got zero point two four, you got it correct. Did anyone not get zero point two four? You didn't get it. You got it. Yeah, that's what I think you said. So, kind of what I'm doing because it's really hard to see it on the mm -hmm. paper. What I'm doing is just. I just like measured what because you can see the bigger lines, the bigger box lines. So I'm just like making my offers at point two zero, and it's kind of just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I know a, I think there's a magnified glass on the test. Mm -hmm. Yes, it allows you to see see it. But just keep in mind, this calculation is your bread and butter for this exam. You're gonna have twenty two questions about calculation. You need to get really good at calculating because if you don't get those, you're gonna fail that test. So we have we have a lot more. So okay so let's go to question number three. What is the QRS interval? Just remember, one small box is 0 0.04. You do know that much. Take it from that point. One small box. That's why I picked the, the I picked the questions that we had a hard time with. Because I figured if I had a hard time with it, you would have a hard time with it. That way you'll be properly prepared for the test. So I put these hard questions on here on purpose so that you can kind of get comfortable with them. So we do know. We start here and you end it there. So that's one box, that's two boxes. So two times 0 0.04 is 0 0.08. So that's 0 0.80. So, so when you have an answer like that, where you're basically, you pick the next closest one. Because maybe very small gap to you know what the the real answer is. Maybe it's because you can't really see the little space of uh, half a box that's in there. But mm 
What are you guys thinking for that answer? Just kind of give me a guesstimate for answer number three. A, 0 0.10? That's correct. That is correct. So we just kind of just took the, just, just knowing that one small box is 0 0.04 and just kind of zooming in on it and looking at it and being able to make a decision from there. That's how hard the measurements are, okay? Yeah. Okay. So you, like I was saying, if you if you saw two boxes, it would, you would say 0 0.08, but there's no 0 0.08. Your nearest one is 0 0.10. You, none of the other answers would match because it would be too big. So you have to pick those answers, you know, in a very uh, smart way. Okay, so this next one is a QRS interval question. And just remember, one small box is 0 0.04. So now you got to take some time to look at that, figure out what that may be based off of Just looking at it. So let's zoom in on it a little bit. There's our box. We're going to begin there and end there. Based off of knowing that one small box is 0 0.04. You can just kind of make a decision from that. So that's basically what I had to do when I was taking this test. Yeah, let's say it's covering up the two boxes. 0 0.12. Okay. I thought that for the first one or the second one, I could tell yeah. they were 0 0.08. Okay. And the next one I thought was 0 0.08. The first one I thought was 0 0.08. So you're going with 0 0.08. Okay. You're going with 0 0.08. Okay. 0 0.08. Okay. What about you, sir? You're going to go with uh, 0 0.08. What is that's, our answer? That's the right answer. 0 .08. 0 0.08. Do you see why I picked these questions for, for y'all practice? So would you just go, like when you're doing the test, just like what majority, because like, the first one looks like 0 0.12 to me. So would you do what majority of them are? So this is what, when we looked at it, we saw that one person picked 0 0.12. And we didn't know what the answer was. We knew it wasn't, it wasn't two to three boxes, right? We zoomed in on it. I looked at it with the with the magnifying glass. At first, I wanted to say 0 0.02. And I'm like, but that's not half of a small box. So I went with 0 0.08. I took the test on Friday and I got it right. I process of eliminated that. Well, if you look at the other one, you saw 0 0.0. Yeah, the last four to me. Yeah, but the first one that. wasn't. So you you might want to do you know uh, measure because normally these should be equal right mm -hmm. so where the majority is mm -hmm. that's what the answer will okay. be yeah, yeah. okay so here we are with our next one it says what is a pr interval Thank you. 
Well, pick one. Pick one. Pick the best. The lines on mine, I feel like it's like. Okay, you just pick your best answer. What you could do is you can take your phone, take a picture of it, and zoom in on it. It kind of help you with uh, seeing it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. You want to go? Okay. Okay. So these two go with point two four, and you're going with point two two. Okay. Okay. She's going with point two two. They're going with point two four. What are you going with, ma'am? Point two two, ma'am. You decided what you want to go with. Jared. Yeah, Point two two. What is the answer? Point two two. 0 0.22. You see why I chose these? Because if I, I had trouble with it, I figured you would have trouble with it. So that's why we, we put it on there. Um, and the only reason why we, we chose 0 0.22 because our last colleague that took the test, another educator, she got 0 0.24. And I was like, well, that's what I thought it was at first. And I was like, if she got 0 0.24 and I couldn't, like, what is the answer? So I took the test and I was like, okay. And I, I just kind of picked what I, I thought it would be and it was 0 0.22. I have a question. Yes. Are we measuring the, the peak of um, P, I mean, R? Or so you're going to be, you're going to be measuring, so this is not the best corner, but um, uh, uh, So I would start right there, put a line right there, hash and mark right before that P wave, and hash and mark right there, and count in between. But isn't that isn't that cute though? So normally, if you would, if you start, this is the art, right? Yeah. If you do a line right here, down to the beginning of your P wave, right? So you're gonna be measuring from here to here. That's your PR end of it. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing really quickly and just kind of go over what how you should be measuring this so you can have a, a kind of like a guide. So give me just a second to pull up uh, something to kind of refresh your memory on uh, how to measure. And you could take a picture of this so you can um, you'll be able to. Uh, Okay, so we you are asking something about this picture helps. If you could take a picture of this, this may help you with measuring, knowing what to measure. <laughs> Hopefully this is we're gonna actually use that measuring from the R is like it's on the P. So we're measuring PR interval. So right before that the that, that R wave forms, you want to put a line right there, an imaginary line right there. And then you want to put another line right here because that's where your PR interval is going to be. You'll be you will be measuring in between that PR interval. And you will count the number of boxes that's in between that line. And multiply that times 0 0.04. So it would be good to just take a picture of this so that you have an idea of where you're going to be measuring. And then for your QRS, you're going to be measuring wherever that PR interval ended is where the QRS is going to begin. And then right here, you see this line here, You'll that's where your uh, ending of the QRS will be. You will be measuring in between those lines and multiplying times 0 0.04. And if you look at this where your Q begins, okay, so you're trying to measure your uh, QT interval from here to here is where you're going to be measuring QT interval. So you'll 
mark a line right there where that PR interval ended. Here, where the T wave is at, where that line drops down to the isoelectric line, you're gonna put a line right there and you're gonna be counting in between from here to here for the QT interval. And then I have a video I can show you guys about the QT interval as well as we go through that. So if you can take a picture of this and as you're measuring, that'll help you with uh, trying to make a decision about uh, what the answer should be. So does anybody have an answer for number five? Yeah. 0.22? We went over Okay, we already went over number five? Okay, so we're on number six. Yeah. Oh, we're on number six. Number six was the QRS interval. Does anybody know what that one is? You, you, you going with B? Okay. What are you going to go with? B? B. 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 Correct. And what are you going with, sir? B. B. Okay. That is correct. The answer is 0 0.08. Here's another PR interval question. Anybody figured it out yet or still working on it? B. So you going with C. What are you going with? B. Okay. B. 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 C. C. So we have a tie between, so we're not a tie, but we. Some saying C and some saying B. What is the answer? The answer is B. Zero the answer is B 0 0.16. You see the close, how they close. Uh, it, that's why it's hard to, you know, that, that makes it that's hard because two inches are close to each other. And so you got to measure it right to get the right answer. Hey, everyone, it's here. Okay. All right, we're going to, uh, our next question is going to be like QT interval, but I want to, uh, at least uh, play this video so you can kind of have an idea how to measure your QT interval. Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RN.com. And in this video, I'm going to be reviewing the QT interval, which is found on the ECG. So let's get started. The QT interval starts at the beginning of the QRS complex and ends after the T wave. And this demonstrates the time it takes for electrical signals to cause the ventricles to contract and then rest. With this, you're looking at the measurement. Typically, it's anywhere between 0 0.35 to 0 0.44 seconds, and men have shorter intervals than women, and it really varies depending on if it's a fast heart rate or a slow heart rate. Fast heart rates have shortened QT intervals, and a prolonged one could increase the risk of ventricular dysrhythmias, like torsades de plant. Then you want to take a look at the QT interval, and again, that was found at the beginning of the QRS complex to the end of the T wave. And you just want to count the boxes from there to there. Here we have about nine boxes. So that gives us 0.36 seconds. And just track that down all throughout the strip and just confirm you have that throughout. Okay, so that wraps up this video. And if you'd like to watch more videos on ECG interpretation, you can access the link in the YouTube description below. Hey, Okay, so we, we got a chance to um, at least look at that and get an idea of what um, what it looks like to measure that QT interval.
So now we're moving on to the QT interval questions. So you can try to measure. You can have an answer already? Okay. Wait on the rest of the group. You think you can have an answer? Okay. Okay, you, you want to go with A? What are you going with? A? Okay. A? Okay. A? Okay. Sir? Ma'am? A? A? Okay, so then everybody pretty much went with A. And that's the correct answer. So A, 0 0.44 is the correct answer. Okay. Now, uh, I just want to add that for the PowerPoint, your QT interval should be 0.34 to 0.43. This video showed 0.44. So literatures will have different numbers. Uh, follow the guideline of the hospital when it comes to what they consider a prolonged QT interval. And uh, so that you can have the correct intervention and know what to do. Okay. 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 Here's the next one. What is the QT interval? Already get one. Please. What about you, Jared? Okay. All right. The answer is C zero point three six. Okay. All right. So we have the heart rate question. So I took a couple of the heart rate questions on the test. And then typically, what we have been teaching you is to just multiply the number of R rates times 10, and that was your heart rate. Well, the questions that I put on this, this particular practice test are the ones that you that you wouldn't get that answer if you multiply it times 10. You would have to use the 1500 method. Are you guys familiar with the 1500 method? No? Okay. So let me just kind of just briefly go through it with you. So you see I have the peak of this R wave right here, right? And I have the peak of that R wave right there. So what I would do typically, let me kind of go over it. I would just kind of like count the number of small boxes that's in between these lines. So I, that falls right there on a dark line. So that's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28. So that looks like 28. So if I took the number 1,500 and divided by 28, So I got like uh, 53.57, right? But I don't have a number that's close to that under. So I would just kind of just keep going through it and figure out what I what I would think it should be. That was just one of them. But that's how you do the 1500 method. So if you can go through that and figure out what you think the answer should be. If you multiply times one, two, three, four, five, six, the answer number 60 is on, not on it, because that's six times 10 is 60. And the next answer we have closest to that is 70. So we know it's not 70. And I just did the 1500 method, and I got 53.57. Just, just one of those I looked at. So just kind of guesstimate what do you think that should be based off of that. You might be able to pick another order or and just count the number of small boxes and see if you can come close to that answer. Jerry, you look like you have something. Yeah, 55. You're gonna go with A, 55, okay. A, 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 
What are you going with, ma'am? Okay, so, so everybody's going with. Are you using math again? So you're going to take. Um, so you're going to take a R wave to R wave, right? And you're going to count the number of small boxes. And count the number of small boxes in between that R to R wave, those R waves. Mm -hmm. So I got 28. I took the number 1500 and divided that by 28. And when I calculated, I got 53.57. That was just from, from that box. You can pick in any one of these to be able to get your answers. Okay, so you're taking the number 1500, dividing it by the number of small boxes in between the order or intervals that you've chosen. And that's how you come up with that, that heart rate based on the 1500 method. Okay, so our next one, here we go. What is the heart rate? If you count one, two, three, four times 10 is 40, but we don't have 40 on there exactly. So if you could take an order or interval, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take an order or interval, pick that order or interval, you're gonna count the number of small boxes in between those lines and multiply, uh, divide, uh, take that number, so say for instance, you got the number 20. You're going to take 1,500 and divide it by 20. What you could do if you can't really see it, you can take your phone, take a picture of it, zoom in on it so that you can count. And divide the 1,500 by the number of small boxes that you got between an order or interval. Okay. All right. So if we if we can't like, count the boxes, can we just um, do the um, four times ten and choose the closest number to that, which is thirty-seven? You could. Because if you multiply by four by the ten, the answer would be forty, right? Yeah, but, but there's no forty. But it's closer to thirty-seven and forty-five. Yeah. So. Well, that's what we were doing when we were taking this test. We were, we were trying to figure it out and guessing it. Because these were very, I, I, I felt that they were very difficult test questions. And I was like, if I'm having trouble with it, you will have trouble with it. So I picked the hardest questions for this practice test. So, anyone? Uh, okay. 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 Ma'am, what are you going with? One, one person left. What do you think, ma'am? Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, okay. Oh, so what, what's the answer? That's the correct answer, 37.
All right. Uh, here's another one. What is the heart rate? So we only have one person so far that's told if you need to answer. Anybody else? A. A, okay. A, okay. Any other uh, thoughts on what the answer should be? I have an A and a B so far. Anybody else taking any other answers? That is, you got B, okay. B. You so quiet back there. I need to know your answer. C. Okay, we have A, B, and C. Uh, the two in the back back there. You see? A. And then Jared, what do you think? B. Okay. All right. What is the answer? That's the correct answer. 125. So the answer is B, 125. I know. I, I barely got that one. So that's why I put it on. Okay, so that's all of the questions regarding the measurements. Now we're going into the cardiac rhythms. Number 13. So looking at this, what is our heart rate? One, two, three, four, five. Heart rate 50. And let's see, we have PQRST, PQRST. Here's a P wave, but then I have a drop QRS. PQRST, PQRST, P. Drop QRS, P QRS T. What do we know? Or what do, do you remember when I said you have a drop QRS? What does that mean? What is that? What that's automatically some type of a block. It's, a block. It's, so we're going to process and eliminate anything that's not a block on here. Wow, we every last one of them are blocks. So first degree is that only block that has one P wave for every QRS. So we're gonna automatically get rid of this here number. Uh, we're gonna get rid of B and we have three left. That's we have A, C and D left. So you can make a decision which type of block this is. Are those PR intervals consistent or inconsistent? <laughs> You going with bees and boys? Bees and dog. Bees and dog. Okay. Same, same. Anybody else got any other answers they're thinking it may be now? Danny? D. Okay. D is a dog. Okay. What about you? D is a dog. Okay. I don't know. I I I don't know what's in there. You 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 don't know. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh excuse me. <coughs> Second degree A B block type two. If you took a piece of paper and you made a line, a hash line for where that PR interval began and a line where that PR interval ended, you took that sheet of paper and you marched, you, you uh, took that piece of paper and, met, and put those lines that you created for the first PR interval, you would line it up to this one. If it stayed the same, that means that PR interval stayed consistent. You're going to skip the QRS that's dropped. You'll come here. Line it up. If it's staying the same, that means it's consistent. Line it up again. If it's staying the same, it means it's consistent. Line it up again, it will be consistent. So in this case, this is second degree AV block type two because there's consistency with the PR interval. And remember, I said you need to get to that tip sheet is going to help guide you to pick the right answers. This is number 14. If you don't know what it is, just say, I, I have no idea.
You can just raise your hand and go ahead and say, I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. You don't know. Okay. You going with D or B? Jerry, what are you going with? D is a dog. D is a dog. D is a dog. Dog. All right. What is our answer, sir? D as in dog. Transcutaneous pace. Transcutaneous pace. This is a little rhythm they added. Um, so quickly you see the pacing, the pace, you know, the uh, spikes. the spikes would be different um, if it was a, a transvenous or, or any other type of pacing, but this one shows like this and so, Recognize it, memorize it. Because it looks like a little gap or something. Yeah, it looks like a, a straight line. Mm -hmm. It looks like a a two by. Right. You know. So this is one of those new ones they put on there, and like I say, it was so many new things that I was like, okay, there's no time to update this PowerPoint presentation, but at least we can add this into practice. So when you take the test, you'll be comfortable with it, and you won't be blindsided. Here we go. Number 15. So there's a spike right before our P wave. Which one? B is a dog or B is a boy? Yeah, the dog. The dog, okay. You going with bees and boy? Okay, you keep your first man. I like to have different opinions and thoughts and stuff like that. Anyone else different? Jared, bees and boy, okay. Bees and boy, bees and boy, or bees and dog? Okay, bees and boy. Okay, Annie, what do you think? Yeah, bees and boy. Okay, so this one, guys. If you look at it, the spike is right before your P. So just think about P as being your atrial. So there's one spike, and it's right before P wave. So if you chose B as in boy, atrial pace rhythm, you got it correct. Because you have a spike right before P wave. If this had been a spike right before your QRS, then it would be a ventricular pace. Or if you had two spikes, a spike right there and a spike right there, then it would be AV pace. But there's one spike, and it's right before the P wave. So that is atrial pace rhythm. You have a question. So D would be the two spikes that you said? If, like, yes. okay. if you had two spikes, yes. One before the one before the ventricle. So, so this both, one both chambers are being phased. Okay. This one is only one chamber being phased, it's the atrial. So it's an atrial pace rhythm. Atrial now, pace. Now one thing I want to add also is that. Try to understand why this is the answer. Don't don't memorize this one is B because I've switched them around. Mm -hmm. So if you see something like that on the exam, don't think B not here is gonna be the B in the in the exam because I've shuffled them. Okay, just understand that a spike between in in front of your P wave is an atrial pace rhythm. Always. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to that next question. So we picked some very good questions for y'all. I bet y'all probably thought this afternoon session was going to be easy breezy. <laughs> Here we go. Look at that question and see what you think. So for number 15, mm -hmm. are you saying that the strip will be exactly on the test just to skip around the answers? So you will have the same exact strip on the test. Okay. Your answer choices may be uh, different. So these strips came to, exactly from the test. You'll see these same exact strips. So we should be studying this when you go home. Don't say, well, I'm not going to worry about it. I'll be able to figure it out. And it's going to be something different. You should get these first mm -hmm. 20, these 22 questions right. This is your gift. Happy Merry Christmas. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So this next one, go ahead and see what you think that is. You got your heart rate. 
Uh, do you have a P wave or no? I mean, just kind of decipher through it and see what you what you gather. Is there a P wave? No, there's no P wave. So sinus bradycardia has to have a P wave, correct? So we can't say sinus bradycardia because we don't have P wave. Okay, so let's scratch that out. Heart rate is 30. You're stuck between A and C. Okay, she's stuck between A and C. So before y'all make a decision, let's just stop there for a second. And let's go to that uh, tip sheet that I want you guys to get familiar with and get comfortable with. Let's look at, um, uh, we know it's in the junctional family. Here we go. Here's our uh, junctional rhythm category. You know, we have our new, the new one we put there. So you see all this right here, right? And you got your heart rate. So we know it's somewhere, it's one of these. Okay. So let's go back. Now can, make, can you make your answer to your uh, decision? Here. You want you want with C? Okay. C. What do you want? What do you want with me? Sir? C. What did he decide? You don't know? Okay. All right. That's okay. You see you see the QRS complex? Yes. Is there a P in front of it? Okay, so that means. The impulse is not coming from the atrium, it's coming from the junction. So it's a junctional rhythm. Now, junctional rhythm should be between 40 to 60, right? What's the rate here? 30. 30, so it is it is junctional, but it's lower than the rate it should be, right? So anything that's lower is considered a Brady rhythm. Anything that's more than that number we're looking for, the 40 to 60, is a accelerated or a tachycardia. In this case, it's less than the 40 to 60, it's 30, so it's a junctional bradycardia. You understand? Okay. So, and that's where you're not going to remember this on a test, so let me just stop sharing for a second and then go back to. Uh, my uh, tip sheet that I want you to get familiar with and get comfortable with. That's what I uh, I sent to you via email. So you would make a decision based off of that heart rate. You already know there's no presence of a P wave and the heart rate is less than 40. So it was 30, which you said it was 30, right? And that would be automatically junctional bradycardia. That's how you make a decision because when you're on a test, you're not gonna remember all this, but you can process and eliminate to the right answer. Stop sharing and go back. Okay. All right. So the answer is C junction of bradycardia. Okay. You're looking like, hmm. Well, I can tell you a little hint. This is a PVC. It's a wide and bizarre QRS. Wide and bizarre QRS. Process of eliminating anything that doesn't have anything to do with PVC. If it doesn't have anything to do with PVC, process of eliminated out of that answer choice. Narrow it down. And then choose an answer.
Just remember QRS wide and bizarre looking like this. This is a PVC. You already know it's not a PAC because that's not a P wave. So you can just say, whoop, you're out. You know it's not a first degree block because all your P waves has a QRS. Now this PVC doesn't have a P wave, so it doesn't have anything to do with blocks. So you can just go ahead and process it and eliminate D. So you're down to A and C to make a decision. <coughs> Y'all are so quiet. You going for C. Okay. You going for C. You going for C. What are you going for? C. Yeah. C. Okay. You're right. So the answer is C sinus rhythm with PDC. Okay. Here we go. So if you look at this, that's a PVC and that's a PVC because the, QB, the QRS is wide and bizarre. So in your answer choice, you're going to eliminate everything that's not a PVC. So this B, sinus rhythm with first degree AV block, we can go ahead and take that out. Of the C, sinus rhythm with PAC, we're going to go ahead and take that out. And we're down to A and D. So now you have to make a choice. Which one is this? Go A, D, D. D, 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 D. Man, what are you going with? A. A. Okay. So we have one A and everybody else is saying D. What is the answer? C. Mm-hmm. You sure? 18, right? Number 18. We're gonna go with this. So we have a P. This is normal. That's normal. B three is that normal. One, two, three. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So you see, we really can't. There's not a trend right there, but we can start right here with this first normal B. B one is normal, which means it has a P Q R S T. B two P Q R S T. B3 or PVC. So on every third B is having a PVC, but that's trigeminy. Because we have, we have a PVC falling on every third B. It would be after every if, uh, the second B is a PVC and it's a bad gym. You have to count the PVC. The PVC is actually a B. It's, it's the ventricle responding before it's time. It's a natural beat. So the regular one, the second one is a PVC, so that's your bigen. If the third one, then that's a trigen, which is the case here. Any, any questions on about how to understand it and interpret it? Because I got it wrong. That's why I wanted to put it on there. I was like, you know what? I'm putting this on there. I got this one wrong. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure you guys had a... I think we put this on there twice, right? Yeah, it looks uh, like it. We might have to go back and adjust it. Okay. Anyway, you probably already know what this one is, right? We have to maybe put it on there twice. Okay. You all should know what that one is. Okay, we'll have to go back and take that one out and put something else in. Okay. All right. Let's go 20. know what it is, right? You guys. <laughs> okay, so the answer for that one is D is in dog monom monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Hey. Here we go. Number 
Count your heart rate. Start off by counting your heart rate. What is your heart rate? Two twenty. Two twenty for your heart rate. So let me just stop sharing and go to that tip sheet. All right. So uh, we're gonna go to our tip sheet. Look at that. Because that's what you're going to be using as your guide when you're taking your test, because you're not going to remember that. So we're looking at our heart rates. Okay, we have sinus tech, 100 to 150, SVT, 150 to 350, AFib with RVR, 100 to 180, and then we have Junction tech, 100 to 150. We said the heart rate was 220. Okay, so let's go back to the test. Okay. Okay. What do you think it is now that we went through the, through the heart rate? 220 for our heart rate. Could it be sinus tech? That's 100 to 150, so we can eliminate that. Um, it can't be VTAC because you would have your QRS is going to be greater than. Uh, your QRS is going to be greater than 0.12. This QRS is less than 0.12. So we're going to eliminate A and eliminate D as in dog. We're down to B and C. Our heart rate is 220. Is that order or interval, regular or irregular? Regular? regular? Okay. And so we looked at the tip sheet and what did it guide us to? Okay. Let's go back to our tip sheet. Again, this is order or that's regular. This is order or interval that's irregular. Heart rate 150 to 350. And this one 100 to 180. We said 220 and the order or was regular. Right? Okay. So going back to our uh, test, because that's how you want to be able to go through this and decipher what the answer is. We had narrowed it down between B and C. So let's go with our final answers. C, C, C. Okay. So our answer is what? Uh, C, superventricular tachycardia. And you wouldn't have had to know the answer if you had just counted the heart rate, looked at your order or interval. And that's why I want you to take your tip sheet get comfortable with it. So when you take your test, one of your sheets, scratch sheets of paper should be for you to write down those uh, criteria from uh, memory before you take your test so you can make the right decision. Okay. Is that it? We have one last question here. Okay. Here we go. So, if you look, there's a spike. There's a spike there, there's a spike there. Spike, spike, there's a spike. This is my P wave. I got a spike before my P wave. Here's my QRS. I have a spike before my QRS. So we kind of know that this is in the pace rhythm family. So we can go ahead and process, process of eliminate answer choice D. D is in dog. We're going to eliminate answer choice D. And we're going to go with A, B, and C. Now make a decision on what you think that answer should be. You go over C. C. Okay. Answer C. C. Atrial ventricular pace rhythm. Is that thing you're ready for the test? Let's take it now. No, <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to stop sharing that screen and it, do you think you have any other questions or concerns uh, in preparation for the test? I think we think it might need a little bit of explanation of to work with you on to understand the concept better. Now is the time. Otherwise, you have material. I think she sent you some stuff in your email as well to review. Um, 
So, your order, your order, are are going to be equal because that that's going to be a, a regular rhythm, right? So if you pick, it might not fall on uh, on, a, on a dark line for you to get a right measurement, but you'll be able to pick one that's where you want it to be, so you would count the small boxes, right? If you could count the big boxes, you know each. Big box has how many small boxes? Five. So if you count how many big boxes you have between those R to R, and then when you get to the point where it's only little small, maybe two or three left, then you add them, and then you divide by 15. And you should get a number that's going to get you close to the right answer. Um, and then cross the elimination, you will be able to find you know, your answer. Um, so about that, I have a question about 12. So 12, if we count it, what is it, like 12 times 10 is 120. So it's like between 115 and 125. But then when you do like the 1500 method, mm -hmm. I got like 107. So I don't know what I did wrong there. Uh, so we're going to go to number 12 and you say you, you, got, you got a different number. 12 was, the answer was 125? Yeah. Yes. So if you count it, so if you count it, if you do the counting uh, of the the R to R waves, it it will give you one twenty, right? Mm -hmm. But you have uh, that small space after it that's left. That if you look at your answer, right? If you count it one twenty. It should be, it can be less than 120, right? Mm -hmm. So that means you're gonna get rid of 115, and then you're gonna have left 125, 135, and 143. You would need 14 to get 143. Okay. You would need 13 to get 135. So you that those are gone already. So you left with 125. Okay. So it's a matter of being smart about it. It's a matter, it's a matter of Get rid of the ones you don't need, the ones you know that's not there, and then go with the your best answer. So I'm gonna zoom in on this one. So right there, that's like right on that line. I'm gonna just count backwards to this one, but this is the order or intervals I'm gonna use. So that's we we already know that's one small box. So that's that's five. This is 10, 11, 12 ish. So if I took 1,500 and divided it by 12, let's see what I get. I got 125. So I took this one, these here. So that's right there on the line. So you can just go ahead and just take to say that's five. That's another big lower square. That's five plus five is 10, 11, 12. So that's 12 boxes. Oh, I was getting 14 on the one Okay, so I'm taking that 1500, taking 1500 and dividing that by 12, and I got 125. Yeah, trying to, trying to pick one that's like on, on one of those dark lines, and then you put one box, two box. That already gives you 10 for those two. And then you count one, two. That's your 12. And that's for those rhythms where it's hard to count and get the right answer. And then that way you can just kind of practice with it and get comfortable with it because this, this is complex. But that's why I picked the most complex questions for practice. Any other questions you guys can think of that, that, that you may want to ask? Because if you're thinking it, your classmate is thinking it, they just probably may not feel comfortable asking.
No other questions? No other questions? Okay. All right, because we're getting ready to stop the video. This is going to be used for the next class. So if you have any questions or you think any thoughts that you may No. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing. And I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katarina White. I am the education coordinator for the Texas Division. Uh, I recorded recorded the uh, ECG video, uh, but today we're just going to uh, kind of go into a deeper analysis of uh, how to measure properly. Okay, so I'm going to just share my screen. Um, I provided you with a copy of the uh, just how you should be measuring. So we're going to just talk about that PR interval. So as you can see here on this uh, document, you see that line that's being drawn right there? You're going to hash a line right there before this P wave starts to you know, form. So your line is gonna be there. That's where the PR interval begins, okay? And here you'll see this line that's where the Q, QRS starts to form. So that's where your PR interval will, that's where it would end. And so what you're going to be doing is counting the number of small boxes that's located in between this. But I've given you this so as we go back through the practice test, you will uh, have something, a guide. Okay. So QRS, QRS is going to, it's going to, uh, begin where the PR interval ended. And then it's going to end here where I'm pointing. You're going to be counting the lines in between that. QT interval. Okay, the Q, Q waves, uh, right before that Q wave forms. And then you're going to end it right there where that T wave drops back down to the isoelectric line. We're gonna practice with this so that you can be comfortable with it. Okay, practice makes perfect. Okay. All right, so I am going to um, scroll down to my next thing I wanna talk about. So let's talk about the small boxes and the lower square. A small box is 0 0.04. Now, I've, like I said, in the past, I've done a lot of remediation. And uh, people come to me and, you know, the first thing I want to know, what is one small box? Can you tell me what that, that equals? What is it? And I've had people tell me 0 0.6, 0 0.8. And so their measurements were off and therefore they couldn't get through the measurement aspect of it. So just remember that 0 0.04 is one small box. Okay. All right. And so let's talk about the lower square. That's going to be defined by a dark line. So you have a dark line here and a dark line there. And it's going to be five small squares high. One, two, three, four, five. And it's going to be by five small squares long. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Any questions about the small square, the large square, where you measure everything at before we move on to the next step? No, okay, All right. so I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen here. So let me just uh, let me just pause recording right now. Okay, so let's see. Okay, everyone, you should be looking at the ECG practice test, and you'll see at the very bottom, it has a date, 1-2, 2024, version A. That is what you should be looking at. That's what this, this the test you're going to be taking. These questions are going to be reflective of that, okay? So just want to make sure you're looking at the right one. All right. So our first question of... Uh, 
ask us about the uh, PR interval. So we're just gonna go through this and just kind of show you where you should be measuring. All right, so this is a, that's a T wave, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. So you're gonna be hashing a line right before that P wave forms. And then you're gonna be hashing a line right here where, where that QRS is going to start to form. So that's where your PR interval is going to end. <clears throat> so if you could take out uh, some paper or you, you got a pen, if you have the printout, if you can just kind of mark a line where it begins and ends so that we can see what, what's, what's going on. If you could just raise your hand once you've marked that line so we can come by and look and see if you're measuring it properly. Yes, She's making copies. So if you have a copy of yours and you've already measured it out where the PR interval begins and where the PR interval ends on your paper. Do you have do you have paper? Okay, you've already did yours. Okay. He's gonna come and see what you uh but anyone else uh have you uh marked down where the PR interval begins and ends? Mm -hmm. Do you have a copy? Yeah. She's making your copy as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, she's pretty much making everybody a copy. Yes, just for you. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, maybe I should uh just pause recording and see if she's finished. Right. Okay. So back to um the screen here. Um, so were you guys able to figure out that it was 0 0.12 by looking at the measurements? Yes, we were yes. talking about some of them have uh, four boxes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, so, so this one was one of those difficult ones that we had, uh, we were trying to uh, decipher what the answer was. So, um, and 0 0.12 was the answer. We had one educator took the test, and then I took the test. We were just trying to figure out what was what because if we're going to be remediating, we need to know how to tell you how to measure. Okay. So on the second one, PR interval. So um, let's see, that is P, Q, R, S, and that's a T wave. P, Q, R, S, that's a T wave. So you just want to make sure that you, you kind of know where you're going to be uh, starting your hash mark right there. And then you're going to end it right there. Now, this is not the this strip is not the best quality, but this is one of the ones on the test that people uh kept missing. So if you put a mark there and a mark there, so that's about I count about seven boxes. I'm not sure if that's what you guys count, but you can go through on the test and look at each one to kind of figure out. To get a ballpark figure. So, so our answer key is showing the answer is B. Which is zero point two four. So you counted seven. So that's the I counted seven. So, so I, I know that T eight is not on there. So I would pick another PR interval and try to find the closest one. Now I'm not saying that zero point two eight is wrong, it's just that the one that I chose was zero point two eight. So when you're taking your test, go through those PR intervals until you can figure out which one closely mirrors that answer, if that makes sense. Because the test is very, very intense. There are 22 measurement questions on the test. So uh, you have about 12 measurements on this practice test to help you get prepared. You have a question. Okay. okay. So um, when did you read in script and how was 22 uh, measurement questions, which consist of PR interval, QRS, uh, QT interval, and heart rate. And the other half of the test is uh, interpretation. Interpretation. Yes. Okay. So here we are with number um, three. What is the QRS? So remember, P Q R S T, P Q R S T. So you're going to be measuring about right there to there. 
Okay. So just me looking at this, we, re we recall one box is 0 0.04. So if I'm measuring from here, there, so I see about one, two boxes for me. Now over here, this looks about two boxes. That's what I see, two boxes. But our answer choices, this is what we have to work with. Our right, answer choices. So what do you think the answer would be? And so oh. 0 0.10 is the answer. That is the closest that we could come up with when we were doing our measurements. They didn't have 0 0.08 on there, but the closest thing to that was 0 0.10. And that's how we were able to get that answer. Now, other people took this test and get that right. So I picked all the measurements that people kept getting wrong mm -hmm. to put on your practice exam to give you an idea, of, to, you know, just to get you prepared. Right. So this one is asking for a QRS in here. So what I see when I look at this, I'm starting here. I'm ending it about there. One, two, that looks like about two boxes. Uh, let me kind of go in a little bit more. It looks like about one of, this may be one box, but this, this is not the best uh, image. So let me just kind of decrease it. <laughs> so I feel like it's two boxes. Okay. So on your answer key, what do you see? What is the answer? Key? B, B 0 0.08. So that's just me narrowing it down and remembering that one small box is 0 0.04. I see two boxes. It looks like two boxes, and I multiply that times um, 0 0.04 and get that 0 0.08. Okay, so here, the PR interval. So again, I'm going to be starting about right there, and I'm going to end right there. So it's just a matter of just choosing one of the boxes and just trying to go through it and see what you get. So me, let, let's uh, kind of see if I can uh, increase the size. So if I'm right, about right there, I know that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. -ish. That's about seven boxes. If I start about right there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I, I, I don't know. I just keep counting seven boxes Hello. for some reason. I don't know. What we're on number of the amount of right now, number five. And that's what I see. That's what you see. I'm, I'm just saying that's what I see. That's how difficult the measurements were on this test. I feel like they were very advanced and I'm like, you need to be a cardiologist to go through this test and pass it. That's how intense the measurements were. But just for me, anyone else see anything else other than that seven boxes and you see something different? Did anyone count anything different? You, you, you would have said six? Okay. Okay, six. Okay. You have a question? Okay. Okay, so B is the answer. which is 0 0.22. I have no idea how they got that answer. I have no idea, but like she counted six, I counted seven, but they're saying the 0 0.22 on the test. Now, we had a, a one other person, uh, maybe two people took the test and they got 0 0.24 yeah. and then um, it was wrong. So uh, we both kind of looked at the measurements again. I was, I was like, okay, let, let me take it. That's, we just kind of chose 0 0.22. And then that was the answer. Cool. Yeah, 0 0.22 was the answer. Mm -hmm. Now, does, does it make sense? It doesn't. But these are the hardest measurement questions that we pulled 
out of the samples to kind of give you ideas so that you can practice and be prepared for the test. Because if you find six boxes, it would be 0 0.24. Yeah. But to be right? honest with you, that, that doesn't make sense either because if it's if each small box is 0 0.04, how do you divide the small box? You can't even get a 0 0.22 answer like that. It's really like, mm -hmm. that's like not forcing us to You have to literally like divide the small box to 0.02. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's like forcing us to believe something that's not. Well, in, the, in, the, in real life, your monitor is automatically calculating those for you. It's PM, yeah. And it's it's calculating it to the T. Yeah. So you will find 0 0.22 or 0 0.717, you know, like that when you when those machines are calculated. But so the, if the, so if the human eye cannot detect that what's the purpose of that question? What's the purpose? Um I mean, that's a good question. And that's, why, <laughs> that's a good yeah. question. And we have a meeting with the, with the company tomorrow to ask those questions. That's what I was saying to you. We have spoken to Elias. We've had meetings with them. We have another meeting tomorrow. And our purpose here is to help you through this because there's no way around it. You, are, you have to pass this exam, whether you agree with it or not. So, Moving forward, we're going to try to get a better exam. You know, hopefully something where you can identify the rhythm and identify what the intervention would be. Right? We all agree on that. Yeah. But for now, this is it. And we have to pass it. Right? So 0 0.22 is the answer. Okay. So the next question, number six, uh, is asking about the QRS. And remember, one small box is 0 0.04. So when I look at this, this measuring here to there, hmm, it looks about like a box, maybe. Just, just looking at it, just to see what I see. Look at this one. That looks like one box. If you start measuring from right, right there and end it right there, it's right in between half of a box. So one half of a box and one. So a box and a half. It looks. It's to me. To me, that's what it looks like. So if you have a box and a half, a box is zero point zero four. Half a box would be what, 0 0.02? So 0 0.06 is what I'm coming up with. Is there, the, is there 0 0.06 in the answers? So the answer choice, if you look at the answer choice, uh, this is what we have. So what's the closest to that? And that's the right answer. So B, 0 0.08. And you see how difficult these measurements were, and that's why I chose those measurements to kind of include in the practice. Because I uh, had a small sample of people who took the version A, the new version, and I, I just said, I'm going to choose the answers that people missed. And that's what I put on, on the test to kind of help you prepare. Uh, let's see, the next one, uh, PR interval again. So, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T. So I would start about right there and end it about right there. So one, two, three, four. I got four. Yeah. 0 0.16. Okay. You got 16? Okay. So just making sure I, um, we were on answer number six, correct? Okay. Seven, number seven, B. So I'm just showing this. So as I this recording goes live and she's showing to another group, they'll see so they can see this. Seven, seven is B. And that's 0 0.16. Okay. We're going to uh, the QT interval. Okay. So your Q. RS forms there. 
here's your T. So right where that T wave ends. So that's a whole box. That's that's five. That's 10, 11, 21. So, so what do you, so, so the QT interval seems to be the easiest. Now, if you had these as a QT interval, there's, there's something wrong. There's you know, like torso, you're getting ready to go into torso or something. So A would be the best answer, 0 0.44. I'm just going uh, to look at that A, 0 0.44. Any questions about the QT interval? Uh, that video I showed within the video was very clear and was to the point. It kind of kind of helped guide you. Here's another QT. You know you're going to be starting from here and ended it about right there. So of course, you know, that's five, that looks like six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I counted about 10 boxes. How many did you count? About 10, okay. Anybody else count anything different from that? This is just a guess them in the what I'm counting. <laughs> you counted nine, okay, okay. So just going back and looking at our answer key, uh, it says the answer is C. And so 0 0.36. And this is just so it gets, because I'm recording this, this will make sense for the next group because they may have the same questions and they may have kind of something different. So we'll have different perspectives about the measurements. So let's go to um, what is the heart rate? So uh, there's two ways to count the heart rate. One way is to count it by multiplying the, the number of um, R waves times 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So that six times 10 is 60. So if you look in the answer choices, there isn't 60. So I tried to pull out all of the measurements that use the 1500 method so that you guys can be comfortable with the 1500 method. Okay, so let's kind of go through that right now. So the way you would, um, your 1500 me uh, method, you would take one R wave to another R wave and count the number of small boxes in between there. So I know this is right there on that line. So one small square is five boxes. So I'm going to count from here to here. So that's, that's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, looks like 28. So if you take your calculator, someone say 1,500 and divide it by, what did you get? You got 53.5, okay. All right, that was just a, kind of like a, a guess, right? That's the, that's the best that we can kind of come up with. So the answer for that is A, 55. That was the closest answer. Now, when we were trying to figure out what the answer was, we were like, okay, let's just, we put a question mark by that one and then I took the test and that was the right answer. And we got, we got as close as we could with, with, that, uh, with that answer. So I'm just gonna go to uh, share my screen about the uh, A. Okay, so we have about two more to go. Uh, number 11, another heart rate question, okay? One, two, three, four. 40 is not on there, but we have some close matches. So what, what I'm gonna do is just kind of just pick one. I usually try to pick one that's kind of close on a dark line, but if you don't, you can't get it, that's fine. So I'm gonna just choose this one. So what I what I start off doing is I'll kind of I know I'm, I'm gonna end begin there and begin there, but I'll just kind of count all the ones in between. So that's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 41, 42. 
1,500 divided by 46. That's just a guess. That's, that's how I kind of, my habits of counting of using the 1,500. What did you get? 32.6? Okay. Anybody else count any other? Uh, if you count another one and just see what you get. So like we, we did that. So let me use this one. Okay. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46. Okay, so, okay, so looks like this kind of close, close. Uh, so based on uh, our answer key for number 11, uh, A is the answer. <coughs> So uh, A, 37. I have to tell you that this method only works if the rhythm is regular. Mm -hmm. If it's irregular, it's, it's, it doesn't work. If it's irregular, you're going to count the, the peaks, the R waves. That's the only method that works with the regular rhythm. Now, if it's regular, you could choose the 1500 method. There's another method called the 300 method. Um, it's not, we didn't teach it, but if you count the big boxes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? And divided by 300, how much do you have? Okay, so if you count nine, if you will count eight, and you divide it by 300, you're gonna get as many boxes between R and R waves, you divide it by 300, you will get an approximate answer. Okay. 37? Yeah, so that's the 300 method. And that one also only works with the uh, regular rhythms. The regular rhythm like a fib. <laughs> Count the 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 R waves. So the R waves is consistent. That's when it's regular. It's consistent. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Yep, you can do that both times. But if you have doubts, what your answer is, um, you know. On your regular rhythm, you have choices between the 300 and the 1500 method. So when you're taking your test, first start off with counting the R waves and multiplying it times 10 to get your whole rate. If you don't see it in the answer choice, then you know you need to flip to the 1500 method if you feel comfortable with the 300 method. That's what, that's what you're going to use to measure so that you can be prepared. Okay. So just the full squares, like all, like the five, and then divide that by the, the 300? Yes. Okay. If if the R wave falls on a on a dark line, right? Mm -hmm. You could, yeah. you know, <laughs> this would be counted as a three hundred, right, right. like a full box, oh. and then you go to the next, you know, and divide it by divide it by three hundred, the number of boxes. I'm gonna try to see if I can share uh what that looks like, so you guys can take a um kind of take a uh peek sneak peek of that. I'm looking for um so the A test is verbatim like what the answer keys are too. Is it? Is it really? I would say you need to study what we're giving you. Okay, so you want to take a picture of this <clears throat> method as well so you can kind of have an idea. How to do this? Uh, let me try to. Uh, There's a good um video YouTube video that shows that. Is this? It's on that. Okay, okay so y'all have it in your in your packet. Okay. So yeah. You see, so you, you see, you see how this falls on the dark line. The next one is three hundred. 
150. The reason why it's 150 is because you have two big boxes. You divide it by 300, you get 150, right? Third one divided by 300, you get 100. Fourth one would be 75, right? If, if it fell on this, but it's in the middle. So your answer is going to be between 100 and 75. So they counted 17 small squares, right? That's for the, that's for the uh, 1500 method. But your answer was going to be between 100 and 75 uh, based on the 300 method. All right, so we're going to um, so this is our last measurement question, number twelve, heart rate. So uh, if you're going to be measuring, you want to look at the your R waves. Let's pick one. So I'll pick this one. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I got 13 with that one. Uh, anybody else count a different one and got a different number? So let's count this one. 5, 10, 11, 12, 13-ish. We got a 12. Okay. Anyone else count 12? 12 divided, 1500 divided by 12. What do you get? 136. Okay. 136. Okay. Did anyone use the 1500 method divided by 12? 125. You got 125. Okay. Okay, so um, based on our answer key, um, number 12 is B. One twenty five. Any uh, other questions or anything else you would like? Because that was just a 12. Measurements, just kind of going through that. Any other about the measurements? Okay, I'm going to um, stop recording.